Brother Norman Hare introduced on behalf of the deacons the recommendation that we begin or really take up the final stages of the process of disciplining one of our own. I told you last week we were going to read this two or three times in the next three weeks. Not with the intention of doing a detailed exposition. I've already done that earlier on in our study through 1 Corinthians. I would commend that to you. It's available on Sermon Audio. It's available on, on uh, YouTube under Bethel Owasso. But to read this to you to show you a very obvious passage, meant one of many, but the most obvious passage, that teaches that Christians who commit their lives to Jesus Christ, commit themselves to, to a local church, if that church is following Scripture, that we come under the authority of the Word and pledge, as we just read in our covenant, to live a holy life. We pledge that we would exhort and admonish one another as occasion may require. That's what we're doing. We've been through that portion of the process. I spoke with the individual this week to plead again for repentance to make sure that she knew that we were going through the process and, and where it would, would terminate in terms of our action as a church on the 21st, but that at any time she repented, uh, this, would be, this would be halted and we would begin remediation and recovery. Because you see, it's redemptive. I know a lot of people misunderstand things about this. They, people use terms like, well, you, they're gonna kick people out. You don't kick anybody out of a church. What happens typically is when people begin to pursue scandalous sin or they neglect the means of grace in their own lives and their, their heart becomes cold and dull to the things of, of corporate worship and they don't have a taste for it, an appetite for it, they're not here. <laughs> They've already removed themselves physically. I told the group I was talking to last week that the, the, word, the word belong is from the old English term long to be. Anyone who doesn't long to be among us has said themselves, I don't belong. So understand this. This is purely redemptive. It is purely restorative. It is not judgmental. It is not punitive. I hope you'll see a little more of that today. Stand with me if you would as, as I read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 13. Paul says to that troubled church, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife, and you're arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Not commanded, parenthetically, not commanded not to attend. The best thing that can happen to a person under discipline is to put himself, herself under the preaching of the gospel, but removed from their membership. For though absent in the body, I'm present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you re really are leavened for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, or sister, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, a swindler, not even to eat with such a one, the idea of fellowship, table fellowship. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is, not those, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. What we just read together. The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord teach us further today so that we have a, we have a clear head and a, and, a, and, a, and a warm heart to do the difficult in the Christian life. No one said Christianity is easy. It's simple, but it'll cost you everything you have. 
when you begin to follow Jesus. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, I told you last week that uh, discipline is formative and corrective. We just participated in some formative discipline. We, we were instructing one another in symbol in the Lord's Supper. We had formative discipline this morning when you went to Bible study and you were, you were taught uh, materials from the Scripture. We have formative discipline every time I stand in this pulpit to instruct. There's corrective discipline too. If I told you as a parent, okay, God's given you these children, and I want you to teach them and teach them and teach them well, but you never under any circumstances do anything to correct them, I will have guaranteed your absolute frustration in parenting. Because it takes both formative, corrective, discipline. The same thing is true in the church. We exhort and admonish and encourage one another. And when necessary, we rebuke one another. I was reading an article this week. I think it's by J.I. Packer. In fact, it may be in something I'm going to read to you here in a few minutes. There's only one sin that requires you carry out church discipline to its end of excommunication. And that sin is the unwillingness to repent. Many sins may occasion the need to begin the process of church discipline, but only one sin pushes it to its biblically mandated conclusion, and that's the unwillingness to repent. And that's why we're here. That's why we're here, because that's what we have received from the individual under consideration. John Dagg, I told you last week, the first writing theologian as a Southern Baptist, wrote in his Manual of Church Order, it's been remarked that when discipline leaves a church, that is this corrective discipline, Christ goes with it, that the Spirit of Christ does not reign in power in a church that abandons and neglects church discipline. Last week, we got into the reasons for this, and I told you it was coming straight from our Constitution and bylaws, which, by the way, is a very good document. If you haven't read it recently, you need to go back and read it. But it talks about the discipline of members. There's a section, chapter, uh, section 6.5, and then point one on the purpose of the discipline of members. And I told you last week there were 11 cited. I'm just going to give them to you real quickly. We gave you the scriptures last week. To glorify God by obedience to his instructions. To restore repentant believers. To sanctify the Lord's Supper. To purify the spirit and message of the church. To deny Satan any advantage in the church. To prove leaders love and care. This is proof of love. When someone suggests, well, that's not loving. To know that you need to apply biblical standards to a life that is wayward, that is prodigal, that is, that is in clear violation of Scripture and of the church covenant. To know to do that and not do it is not love for that person. It is a self-love because you don't want to get your hands dirty. True love is willing to do the difficult, to rescue. And that's the motive, that's the drive. What is our desire? You may ask, what's, what, what's the goal here? Well, it's not to say, well, I'm glad we got that behind us, glad we washed our hands. No. It is to plead the blood of Jesus and, and appeal to the, to the individual who has at some point professed fight Christ as Savior to say we love you and we want you to return. That was the language I used this week in the conversation I had. To prove our love and care. To deter others from sin, if it begins to be commonly known that a person can, can commit adultery and just be a, a fair, flourishing members, member in the congregation, I promise you the devil will have a field day with that. And he'll begin to whisper in other people's ears and say, you know, they talk a good talk, but they don't really apply anything. It doesn't mean a whole lot. It's just wind. And the devil will destroy a congregation through temptation. This deters others. Eight to destroy fleshly lust in the believer. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. Hand him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his soul might be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. Nine, to cut emotional ties with unrepentant Christians. They have no reason. Hear me now. A person who is living in habitual sin, whether that is the habitual neglect of worship, whether it is uh, scandalous type sins that have, have public implications, whether it is a, an antagonistic spirit, a, a spirit of division and divisiveness, 
and they continue in their sin unrepentant, should have no reason to believe that they are in fellowship with other believers or in fellowship with God. To carry on as if nothing's happened is to sin against that person who is in deadly, dangerous sin. I'll tell you right now, this person's soul is in danger of eternal hellfire. Nine, or ten, pardon me. To protect scripture from perversion and error. That's when doctrinal error arises. There is no right to teach here whatever you want to teach. If it flies in the face of the scripture. There is no right, right to, to advance ideas in this congregation. If it flies in the face of scripture. And then 11, to shame a brother or sister to repentance. In other words, you bring the applied apparatus that the scripture spells out. And hopefully at some point they go, I am wrong. How could I have gone this way? And then, as I read to you last week, when that happened at Corinth, which it did, Paul wrote the next letter and said, now receive him back. He's repented. Receive him back among you. Don't let him be beat to death by the devil. Well, I told you last week also, biblical love, the necessity is biblical love is violated uh, in serious private offenses. We need to step in on that. Biblical unity is violated by those who form divisive factions, which destroy the peace of the church. Biblical standards are violated by those living scandalous lives, which is where we are with this matter. Biblical truth is violated by those who reject essential doctrines of the faith. Those, those, that's why we come to these times. Today, continuing in our Constitution and bylaws, it, this one takes the following forms. First of all, private or public admonition, particularly through the Scriptures. You may not realize this, but a lot of discipline begins and ends in private admonition. Repentance comes, forgiveness is shown, and the matter is solved. And I've assured this person that if fruitful repentance is demonstrated, which would be to come among us repenting and to cut off the immoral relationship, that we would begin the process of restoring. Romans 15, 14, Paul says, I'm, I'm satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. It's a thing that we do with, toward one another. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness to the Lord. So we, we do this teaching and admonishing one another. It's a part of the ebb and flow of the life of the church. 1 Thessalonians 5.14, We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the fainthearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. And he's talking about there some discipline that came to the folks in the Old Testament. But Paul says it's, re it's recorded for us so that we may be instructed that the Lord will discipline. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, Hebrews says. And I've heard people say, well, why don't we just leave them to Jesus? You want to talk to Ananias and Sapphira about that? God killed them in the early church. It is love when we say we want, to, we want to protect them from the wrath of God by appealing to them. Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It amazes me. People who are habitually absent from corporate worship imagine that when the role is called up yonder, they'll be there. I want to tell you something. A person who can't tolerate worship on earth will not be able to tolerate worship in heaven. C.S. Lewis said heaven would be hell for such a person were they to make it there. So we exhort one another. Secondly, we reprove and rebuke. That's the next step. It begins with admonition. We reprove and rebuke and convince of sin. That's where Matthew 18, 15 teaches us. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. We're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Ephesians 5.11, take no part in the fruitful works of darkness, but rather instead expose them. Bring the light to them. 1 Timothy 5.20, as for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. We would much rather have handled this matter privately, which is where we began, going privately. And we were rebuffed. 
And then more went, stiff-armed. You see, the reason this is where it is now is because of an unwillingness to repent on the part of the offender. 2 Timothy 3.16, we read to you last week, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. A lot of people believe that. Good to, good to teaching. Reproof. Well, I don't know. That's getting kind of personal. Correction. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that being judgmental? For training in righteousness. No. It's being loving. It's being loving. 2 Timothy 4.2, Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with patience, complete patience and teaching. You don't get impatient. This has been going on, in case you're wondering, for about a year now. This is something that happened a few weeks ago. Titus 1.9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict the word, whether by their lip or by their life. You bring rebuke. Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works, by the way they live. Paul says to Titus, they're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. In other words, when you're blatantly sinning against God, even what looks like good works is not in the sight of God. Titus 2.15, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. The next step is corrective discipline. When, when the uh, private admonition and encouragement and exhortation, when private rebuke that goes to public rebuke fails, then the removal of the rights and privileges of membership. It is not a right to come to the Lord's table. It is a privilege. It's a privilege. And so you withhold that. The old term in the church history was they would fence off the table, fence it off so that those who were living in blatant sin would not think that they could come to the table because it's, it's deadly for them. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, that the reason some of you have died there is because you've abused the Lord's table. You've come to it lightly. Matthew 18, 70, if he refuses to, hear, to listen to them, tell it to the church. That's where we are. This is not gossip. We're where we are because all previous efforts have been rebuffed. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, as an unbeliever. You don't treat unbelievers harshly. If you know any people who are not saved, I hope you're loving on them and, and and sharing the gospel with them and encouraging them to get under the gospel. I hope you're not looking down your nose at them. No. When you treat someone as a Gentile and tax collector, that person's an unbeliever. An unbeliever. 1 Corinthians 5.11. I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater or reviler or drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one that you don't, you don't pretend Things are okay. By the way, when this individual has occasion to eat at our table, she knows that it's going to be a gospel evangelistic encounter of necessity. Maybe blood kin, but we're not serving the same Lord who's washed us in his blood. So you make no pretense of that. Doesn't mean you're kind, it means you're clear. And Paul says, purge the evil from among you. And then quickly, the goal of church discipline is always to bring about genuine repentance and complete restoration to fellowship of the member who is under discipline. Let me suggest this to you. When we, when we vote on, on, on October 21st, if the Lord does not hear our prayers and answer and, and cause this to be put on hold by repentance on the part of the offender, when we vote, if you put that person out of your mind, if you don't put that person on your prayer list and are not now and continue to pray and plead the mercy of God upon her life, then you have sinned against her. You've sinned against her. We just read in our covenant. We will, we will faithfully uh, watch over one another, care for one another in brotherly love. This is a part of the brotherly love. It is never to put somebody out of your mind. And I want to tell you, if they go out of your mind, you're sinning. You're sinning. We're a covenanting people who have, who have a, an obvious covenant breaker in our membership, and we're taking steps to see that person restored, recovered to fellowship. Now, the next thing I want to deal with, and time is out today to deal with it, is the process, to take you through the process. I, I showed you the stages, but I want to show you the process. 
so that you understand what we're doing when we come to October 31st. I want to say this too as we close today. If you have any questions, any, any misgivings, any confusion about this, please talk to me. Please talk to me. I've been teaching this, practicing this for about 35 years in the churches where I've been. Because I want you to understand the heartbeat. There's not a fiber of vindictiveness in this. I mean, what kind of monster would I be if I was vindictive concerning someone who shares my DNA? There's none of that there. And there wouldn't be with anybody who comes before us for this purpose. It is love. It's a desire to see God glorified in our midst, to see him glorified in that person's life, to see repentance and forgiveness, which are the essence, they're the absolute uh, irreducible minimums of the gospel, repent and forgive, to see that practiced, to see recovery and restore so that we get to rejoice like the, the prodigal who comes home in Luke. That's what it's about. Please understand that. If you're new to this, if you're being exposed to this for the first time, please understand this. The Scripture teaches it. The Lord demands it of a church that's under the Lordship of Christ. And we're as, as frail creatures of dust attempting to practice it. I told you last week, and I'll end with this, that when the, when the friends of the paralytic heard that Jesus was in a courtyard teaching, they put their friend on a mat they went to the house. They couldn't even get in. The, the crowd hearing him was just was burgeoning over, spilling over to the outside. What were they to do? They could have said, well, we didn't realize we were going to face these obstacles. Sorry about that, friend. We'll just go back home. No. They were determined. They got up on the roof of the house. They began to pull back some of the, the thatches there. Got enough back that they, they lowered their friend. Can you make, think for a minute? If we were talking here and all of a sudden a mat with a person on it began to just come down out of the ceiling and land near the Lord's Supper table. That's what was happening there. They, they were desperate to get their friend in front of Jesus because they knew that if anybody could help him, Jesus could help him. And Jesus looked at him and the scripture says this, and he saw the faith of his friends. And he said to the man, your sins are forgiven. It's not what they were expecting, but I'm sure they were not disappointed <laughs> to hear Jesus say that. Do you have that kind of faith? Do you have that kind of faith? Faith that if we lovingly, intentionally, redemptively drop this person at Jesus' feet, but if he looks at her and doesn't see faith, but he looks at us and sees our faith in him to move, that he would say, your sins are forgiven. And in saying that, not wink at the sin, but in speaking that, to cleanse from sin and provoke repentance. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow before you today in Jesus' name, and we thank you for your word. Very honestly, Lord, if your word did not spell this out, we would not have the natural ability, natural courage to take the steps we're taking. we're trusting you. We're trusting you to honor our efforts, to give us the desires of our heart, which is to see this one restored, repentant. But Lord, if that does not happen, we're trusting you to glorify yourself in our midst for being willing to cast ourselves 
on you in this. So I pray for my brothers and sisters. You give strength, conviction, compassion. And I pray for the one who has brought us to this time that you will work a deep repentance, a fruitful repentance, work rescue in her life to rescue her from hell. Because we know when we read the end of the book that the sexually immoral go to hell. So we ask you to move as only you move. We, to honor our attempt to do what you've spelled out in Scripture we should do and get glory unto yourself in this, in a mighty move of your spirit, in this place. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.